Hello, Mark. Hi, Joe. Um, thanks for thanks for joining me. Um, Pleasure welcome, to be everyone. here. Yeah, great, great to see you uh, live like this. And we're hoping that David Owen Norris will be joining us, but he's having some technical difficulties. So um, he might join us later or we'll have a separate chat with, with David another time. Um, but welcome to what is episode two of the Ludlow Piano Festival podcast. Um, did one with Anne Lovett a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we've got we've got another a couple planned as well for the for the coming weeks in the lead up to the to the piano festival in May. So, um, Mark, um, could you could you maybe just uh, tell us a bit about you? Um, some some of our listeners who maybe are based in Ludlow, especially, may have heard you perform at the uh, St Lawrence's Church not not that long ago. Um, I know you're based in Worcestershire, not too far yes. away. Um, yes. Uh, but, but tell us a bit about what you're doing at the moment and, and projects you're involved with. Well, I suppose British music projects are, are continually simmering away. So Arnold Bax is, is, is very much to the fore at the moment. I'm beginning a, a cycle of, of his piano music recording. Um, but sort of English music is always there for me. Um, having said that, you, you know, other repertoire is, is, is very much um, on the agenda at the moment. So I'm touring next month and, and in fact, in, in around the time of, of your festival as well with the Czech Orchestra. And we're touring um, in this country, Beethoven's Emperor Piano Concerto. Right. So a very un-English uh, piano mm -hmm. concerto. Yep. And, and that's travelling to, to multiple venues in the UK? Or, yes, or it is. Only here yes. for a yeah, we're, right. we're doing it. At, I think I'm doing it at Symphony Hall the night before I come to Ludlow. So it'll be a oh, short, wow. okay. a short trip from Birmingham to Ludlow. Great. That sounds like a busy, busy weekend. Yeah. <laughs> um, David has just appeared. Um, so I'm going to add, add him now and, and hopefully we can hear him. Let's see. Can you hear me? We can yes. hear you, David. Fantastic. Um, so welcome. I, I introduced Mark briefly. Um, I'll, I'll introduce you, David, quickly to our to our listeners. For those who don't know David, um, he is a, a pianist, a composer, and, and broadcaster. Um, we we hear him regularly on on Radio Three, and, have, and many of you have probably seen him on on BBC um, uh, television programs as well. David, well, welcome. And uh, Mark's just been telling telling us about his current projects. Um, uh, including uh, the work of uh, performing and recording uh, the work of Bax, who I know you will be bringing to the festival as well. So could you could you tell us a little bit about what you're working on at the moment and, and recent uh, projects and, and particularly engagement with um, with British composers? Well, at the moment, I'm principally concerned. I suppose the the, the biggest part of my time, alas, uh, is spent with English pianos. I'm putting together a research project to investigate the divided damper rail. And the funny thing about the divided damper rail, which permits you to raise the bass dampers and the treble dampers independently of each other, is that they're more or less confined to pianos built in London. Um, so the square pianos that Johannes Zumpe made, and which his great friend and business partner Johann Christian Bach played in London from about 1766, have two hand levers to raise the dampers, uh, one for the treble, one for the bass. And of course, the difficulty there is that you can't change the pedal until you've got a hand free. But generally, when you're playing the piano, your hands are busy. And only J.C. Bach was, uh, was man enough to, to grasp that nettle. But by the time Broadwoods came along, they had pedals on their grand piano. And they, too, divided their damper rail and they sawed the pedal in half. And uh, so you can put your foot on the left hand bit or the right hand bit, or you can put your great flat foot on the whole thing at once and it's just an ordinary pedal. And it's an astonishingly useful device. And so we've, we're putting together a, a, the, the first detailed study of the Broadwood archives, which go all the way back to the 1780s. And so we're going to get into them and see where these divided damper rail pianos went. We're going to X-ray an entire piano for the first time, other than at um, airports, uh, with a thing called a movies X-ray machine, uh, which is of extraordinary subtlety and uh, detail. 
And then we are going to use that to 3D print a super replica, or at least 3D print parts of it. Uh, bits of it have to be made of wood, of course. Yeah. And um, and I've 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 just got back from Leipzig, where I've managed to uh, enlist the interest of the Grassi Museum of, in of Instruments. They're very interested in this idea of X-raying square pianos, and they want us to X-ray as many square pianos as we possibly can because the curator has got a theory, a private theory of his own, that 18th century soundboards used to be bowed, flexed a little bit. We, the, the general assumption is that they're just flat, but he thinks they're not. And he also thinks that there's a correlation between the density of the wood and the thickness of the soundboard. And so we're, we're going to, Southampton is going to become the piano x-ray capital of the world and we're going to do all that. And then I popped into Bluthners and Bluthners, to my great delight, are interested in this. And so they're going to make a divided pedal uh, modern grand piano. And the reason that this is particularly suitable to Leipzig is because probably the most famous composer who made conspicuous use of the divided pedal was Mendelssohn, um, who, of course, was a resident of many cities, but uh, we chiefly tend to associate him with Leipzig. So at the moment, I'm, I'm sort of doing German music, but English mm -hmm. piano. Fascinating. That sounds really interesting. So is that in collaboration with kind of uh, the acoustics department there in Southampton? Is oh, it, you've got, God, I yes. imagine this is a multidisciplinary project with, with lots of lots of departments involved. It is indeed. Yes, we've got a thing called the Institute of Sound and Vibration Research at Southampton, mm -hmm. which is very famous in its in, in scientific terms. And then we've also got our movies. I, I, it sounds as if I'm saying movies, doesn't it? But I'm not. It's mu, Greek letter. This mm -hmm. um, okay. and uh, th th that department is actually busy preening itself at the moment because on New Year's Day it was on BBC Two with David Attenborough because they had X rayed the fossil skull of a sea monster. So from sea monsters <laughs> to square pianos, no nothing is beyond Southampton. Um, Fantastic. And the, the, the VNA is quite interested in joining in. Um, they're a bit suspicious about running some of their pianos down to Southampton. They're wondering if we can use the X-ray machine at the British Museum, but um, we're possibly, but it's, uh, but the, stag I mean, we haven't actually submitted the bid yet. And so all this excitement and all these many, many weeks of honing documents, it's all writing, isn't it? I mean, so much writing, yeah. but you yeah. know that because you're running a festival, you know that in order to get people to join in, you have to ask them. Yeah, yeah. And so is this, a, is this a research project or is there a performance? I mean, is there a sort of practical sort of performance aspect to this as well? Are you going to be playing some of these well, I, pieces I'll, or I'll reviving pieces? Yes, I'll be recording a lot of um, Mendelssohn and a lot of Johann Christian Bach. And the, the really exciting thing, I suppose, the headline thing, which is what I should have started with if I hadn't been buried in documents for God knows how long. <laughs> uh, the, the really exciting thing is that at the Cobb Collection, Mark, you know the Cobb Collection. Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, yeah, I mean, which, which, oh, I, I love it there. I've, I've, I discovered it by accident about, oh God, 40 years ago, I think. Mm. And um, I had no idea it was there. And to walk into a Commodore Garden stately home, National Trust, and suddenly discover that it's got Kramer's piano in it and Liszt's, I'm not sure that it is Liszt's piano, but, but anyway, all those wonderful Pianos in it, absolutely extraordinary. Anyway, mm. what it has got in it is a, a 1778 Zumper square piano signed by Johann Christian Bach himself. And it, it, it was discovered in a sale near Paris. And it seems perfectly possible that J.C. Bach, we know that he often did this for his friends like Denis Diderot, the uh, the encyclopedist. He 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 would choose a very nice tumper and take it over with him on his business trips to Paris. He used to go to Paris casting his operas, so he would go and find some good singers. And uh, so there's this piano, and Alec Cobb, the um, eponym of the Cobb collection. Alec has a wonderful theory, which I believe wholeheartedly, that. In 1778, Mozart, well, we know this is not a theory, this is the truth. Mozart went and stayed with Johann Christian Bach in Paris after his mother suddenly died while he was on tour. He was very much on his beam ends, absolutely stuck. And his old friend from London 
Johann Christian Bach, 14 years before he'd met him, uh, said, oh, well, come and stay with me. I'm staying at the Marechal de Noray. And um, from this period comes that extraordinary Mozart piano work, unlike any other of his, which is the A minor sonata. Um, and it's got figuration, unlike any other Mozart sonata. That's the left hand, for those who uh, will not know. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it, the other thing about the A minor sonata is that it's peculiarly not in G minor. And when Mozart writes music of that type, sad, passionate, grief-laden, you might say. When he writes music of that type, it's generally in G minor. So why the Dickens is it not in G minor? And you discover that the answer is that the dampers divide between C and B, not between B and B flat. Had the dampers divided between B and B flat, Mozart might well have written this sonata in G minor, but it, they, they don't. And so I, I believe um, that what Mozart did was that he sat at this piano and improvised at it. This very piano, which is at the moment near Guildford. Um, uh, and it was that very instrument, which is still there with the original leathers and the original ivories that both J.C. Bach and Mozart touched and heard. Um, and I, I've played on it a couple of times, uh, the A minor sonata, and it sounds fantastic. It really sounds remarkable. So one of the recordings is going to be the Mozart A minor sonata on the piano that uh, that inspired Mozart to write it, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. No, that sounds fantastic. Uh, anyway, it's not, it's not I, very I, English music, is it? I'm sorry. Well, the, funnily enough, before you came on, David, Mark was saying the same thing, that he's touring and uh, and performing Beethoven. And, and it's interesting to hear that there is this, you know, divide and we do perceive this divide between what is you know germanic perhaps uh, often um and and british music and obviously a, a lot of the repertoire that you're bringing to the festival in may is um a little more contemporary than, than beethoven and, and mozart but um but but there is a is a divide sometimes in in perception and and how we feel about um this repertoire so mark could you tell us a little bit about what it's like playing mozart or beethoven and and how different that is to um engaging with composers like those you're you're uh you're performing at the at the festival it, it's not uh, i mean it's really just different styles really and i think as pianists we we're, we're trained to have to adapt but i think it's the fact that um the Englishness of, of the composers, certainly, that I've chosen is very much filtered um, through the French school. So you can't really look at John Ireland's uh, piano works without seeing how much he was acknowledging the influence of, of Debussy and Ravel in particular. And this is the case with so many of these, uh, of these English composers. And Bliss is another composer who's very much... Uh, in my thinking at the moment, and he, all of his piano music, really, uh, with the exception of one or two very early works, there you've got such a strong influence of Stravinsky. Mm. Um, so really, it's defining Englishness uh, in terms of piano music is a very, very difficult thing to do because it, it's, it's continually eluding. Uh, what most people's perception of Englishness should be. And I think that's, for me, uh, the, the richnesses of the repertoire are in part because of that. It's, it's elusive and it's very difficult to pin down. But certainly, I think uh, the influence with so many of them, early Frank Bridge, for example, uh, the French school was, was, was imperative um, and fascinating that, that as Bridge developed, um, and when he, you know, horror of horrors, he became influenced by the uh, by the second Viennese school. When that happened, he was kind of um, ignored and ostracized, as it were, by the British uh, music establishment. And, you know, tr tragically, his very um, last piano work, which is a remarkable short work, all the publishers refused to have anything to do with it. So I love the um, I love that that element of disengagement that 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 we gave some of our own composers and the fact that really defining what english piano music is is a very difficult thing to do and i think that's that that that's something which many pianists fall into the trap 
they avoid English piano music because they think it's a stereotyped um, style. When in fact, it's only when you really get to know the riches of it, you realize that it, it, it covers so many stylistic standpoints. Mm. So, I mean, it's interesting that you've recorded quite a few sort of complete piano works of composers, yeah. because I think you've, you've done that with Paul Williams and William Mathias, and now you're doing that with, with Bax. And do yeah. you discover that they are just very individual voices and there isn't actually that much that connects them stylistically? It, it, it's partly that and also partly that, that record labels do like from a marketing point of view to have a, a sort of complete cycle. But certainly when we started, and, and I did have to learn very rapidly the, the John Island cycle, there was such a feeling of excitement that I shared with uh, with our producer, Siva Oak, uh, who, who is herself a very fine pianist and studied with Cyril Smith, who was one of our great British pianists from sort of 60 years ago. And the sense of, 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 of discovery that we both felt, because uh, I didn't know this repertoire, um, and it had really been unrecorded since the days of, of people um, uh, like Alan Rowland, sort of 60, 60, 65 years ago. Um, and I had almost consciously avoided English repertoire when I was at the Royal College of Music. Um, so I was, uh, I'm a, a real late convert uh, mm. to this. Um, but and therefore, is that to say that there are, sorry, is, is that to say that there are many other pianists who have been engaged with, with, uh, British composers and British piano music, you know, in the in the last twenty years, has there been a bit of a? Um, I think there's been. I think in the in the last twenty years, probably not. But I think prior to that, and I mean, it's interesting, mm. um, the number of of as it were um, fairly aged pianists and festival directors who have a kind of affection for John Ireland and Frank Bridge because they remember mm. them appearing on Associated Board exams right. uh, when they were children. Uh, you don't see that quite so much now. So um, I would say that there was a hiatus um, of, of perhaps 30, 40 years. Um, and it just happened that, that in one sense, I got lucky um, in, in wanting to do it and also, you know, being prepared to knuckle down and learn the repertoire. Um, but it's been a fantastic voyage of discovery. I mean, mm. you know, David has, as it were, been part of this, um, if I call it revival, much longer than I have. Um, mm. But for me, it's been overwhelming because I didn't know it. I spent all my student years avoiding the John Ireland piano competition at the Royal College of Music, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you come yeah. across it when you're in your, you know, your late 20s, it, it re I just thought it was wonderful. Mm. David, could you tell us a little bit more about the, the timeline from your perspective then in, in terms of the, um, you know, the neglect and the revival of some of these figures? Yes, I, first of all, I, I'd like just to sort of gloss a little bit what um, what Mark said. Um, I think that the difference with English music, I mean, obviously all music is music and yeah. all music is concerned with sadness and happiness and brilliant structures and so intellectual fulfilment and all this sort of stuff. All music does that. Uh, the difference lies with the audience, because in England, our audiences tend to be English. And uh, it's quite a, a different sort of atmosphere when an audience, which has a, a life and a, a sort of um, behaviour pattern of its own, doesn't it, Mark? I mean, audiences, mm. you know, we, mm. we absolutely tell a lot about audiences. But uh, audiences rather love it, uh, particularly if it's a composer that they've really heard of. So it might be Parry, for example. They 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 know he wrote Jerusalem, so they love Parry, and he's and and they understand that this music thing, um, with its emotion and its intellect and all that sort of stuff, is something that's that's perfectly native to their society as well. I think that's useful. Mm. Obviously, I'm even bigger if you play uh, Vaughan Williams or or Elgar, heaven's sake, or Britain. That sort of thing. None of whom happen to have written very, very uh, copiously for the for the piano. Um, so I think the big difference about playing English music in England is that it brings a sort of smile of delighted recognition to the audience's face. Even I mean, obviously they don't recognise it. They would be much more likely to recognise Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, but they wouldn't be delighted 
to recognize that it was Beethoven. They're used to hearing Beethoven and, you know, what could be more wonderful than you, you were, you're playing the emperor, I heard you say, Mark. I mm. mean, fantastic. Um, but uh, th- th- it does make a difference, I think, to the audience. Now, I got interested in uh, neglected English music, not because it was neglected. I didn't know it was neglected. I My upbringing was... Um, Fairly, fairly rural. I'm from Northamptonshire originally, and um, I always think, for example, with with Mendelssohn, people explain that there are the different uh, categories of uh, the different stages of Mendelssohn appreciation. There was Mendelssohn was absolutely wonderful, and then a bit later on, there was Mendelssohn was a bit sugary, and then a bit later on, there was all the trouble with uh, with the Nazis, and then a bit later, well, maybe Mendelssohn. And in Northamptonshire, when I was a child, we hadn't got beyond the first stage. So I've always mm-hmm. thought that Mendelssohn was absolutely fantastic. And it so happened that uh, a good deal of my early musical education was handed over to a delightful elderly Scottish lady who had been at the Royal College of Music in 1912. And so she knew Paul Williams and Perry and Stanford and all these people. And so she would be telling me, stories about these people and to me it was no different from my my grandmother say telling me stories about people that she'd known and so these were always pretty familiar people to me um and so when i got into the the musical world a little bit it was perfectly natural that i would um play that music and then you begin to discover that um well at that time very few other people were playing and singing that sort of music. I mean, I obviously got into um, English song a good deal through a a very firm musical partnership with my old friend David Wilson Johnson, who's also from Northamptonshire. Um, And we dug up Arthur Somerville and we dug up people that, that weren't being done very much, but which had been done by the teachers at the academy, people like Henry Cummings, who had a huge career in the 1930s. And so again, because we knew Henry very well, and as far as Henry was concerned, nothing should have changed since the 1930s. And so all this was very uh, current repertoire to us. And uh, as I say, the, it's the sort of repertoire that brings delighted smiles to the face of audiences. So I've been very pleased to to spend a long time with English music. And we've got we've got a really exciting programme from you, David, and in some ways an unusual programme because it's it's things we don't hear very often. And could you tell us a little bit about this programme? You're playing the, the Bach's second sonata, um, variations on a theme of Henry Purcell by, by three British composers, James McMillan, Michael Barclay and William Mathias, and then uh, a couple of pieces by Madeline Dring, but I wonder whether you could start by telling us about the Elgar improvisations, because these are particularly interesting in terms of the way they came about. Yes, the um, I, I mean, I, I could tell this in the detective story manner, or I could tell this in the in the what I have come to believe as I've unpicked the detective story manner. But uh, on in, in, in November 1929, the 72-year-old Elgar went into the small recital room at the Queen's Hall and uh, armed only with a record producer and a bucket of hot wax. And he recorded five improvisations. And over the, I've, I've played these improvisations by ear for ooh, 30, 35 years, I think. Um, uh, they've... Some, uh, Ian Farrington has published a written down version of them now. Um, but uh, I, I found it particularly interesting to play them by ear because I was following Elgar's fingers and therefore I was also following Elgar's mind. Now, one of the things to bear in mind about Elgar as an improviser, he was a famous improviser and uh, he, he said of his own piano playing, I scramble through things orchestrally in a way that would madden with envy all existing pianists. And when you listen to him in a a slightly frail way, because 72 was quite elderly in 1929, so he's a little bit frail, but you can hear what he means and you can tell that he's doing things with his fingers that um, solo pianists generally don't do, but which repetiteurs do all the time. People in opera houses, if there are any opera houses left, uh, tend to sit and and rattle their chords and 
tremolando and and put their elbow down on the bass note to be the big bass drum and all that sort of thing. And that was clearly what Elgar was very good at. What he wasn't was Oscar Peterson. He wasn't Oscar Peterson. And so there there are moments when you can hear Elgar thinking, hmm, or perhaps. And for that moment, his, his fingers stubbed a little bit. Over the years, I've been able to show that these improvisations were connected with the idea that was always in his mind in his late years, of the piano concerto. And um, so it's quite interesting to think how these improvisations might have turned into a piano concerto. And it's something that I'm giving a great deal of thought to at the moment. There are, of course, also sketches um, that Elgar left for a piano concerto. And the interesting thing, this is the, the detective story bit of it. One of the... Um, sketches has a date written on it, March the 13th, 1918. And some of the people listening will have to forgive me for briefly pointing out that Elgar's fiance, lost fiance, who went off to New Zealand to die of tuberculosis, but in fact didn't die, and who had a son, Kenneth Munro, Elgar had been meeting. Kenneth Munro during the war because Kenneth Munro had signed up with the Anzac forces and he was wounded at Gallipoli. He was invalided back to London and there's very compelling evidence that Elgar met this young man who might have been his son. And a lot of people have a theory that Elgar's, perhaps his most poignant work, the cello concerto, uh, was written in memory of Kenneth, who died in the Second Battle of the Somme just a little bit later in that March 1918. March the 13th, he was still alive. And the interesting thing about this date written, this very poignant date written, is that it's the, you, you know that Elgar habit when he pretends that it's a minor chord in the first inversion, if we think about inversions or whatever but uh, i tell you what the land of hope and glory and the glow is sort of a, a minor chord at first and then it sort of sweetens onto a major chord when he gets to glory this is an absolute elgar fingerprint now the tune that he's just written where he's put this date is the only occasion in the whole oeuvre of elgar that i've ever found where he does land of hope it's, it's it's a different tune but i mean it is as if he had done land of hope and glory and as if he'd stayed on the sad note and mm. i think he was thinking of kenneth who might have been his son lining up ready to go up to the front perhaps to lose his life. And in fact, he did lose his life. And of course, when he did lose his life, Elgar read it in the papers and had a nervous breakdown and set off on an odyssey round uh, England by rail until he got as far as Oxford Railway Station when he collapsed and was taken to the Ackland Hospital. And it's the most amazing story. And, it, and it's wonderful to think that all this is encapsulated in a date on an Elgar sketch. Mm. And 1929 just to run to the other end, was the, the first year that he had to think about concertos after having finally got a decent recording of the cello concerto. As with so many great Elgar works, the cello concerto had an absolutely disastrous premiere. Everything that Elgar wrote had a disastrous premiere. The Second Symphony, for example, the, the audience sat there and Elgar had conducted his Second Symphony and the audience was going... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Elgar said to the leader, his friend Billy Reed, he said, what's the matter with them, Billy? They're all sitting there like stuffed pigs. And it was one more dreadful example of a, of a bad premiere for poor Elgar. Well, the cello concerto was no exception. And it was only in 1928 
that Elgar finally secured a decent performance uh, on record with Beatrice Harrison of the Cello Concerto. And so that's why in 1929, he started to think about the, cello, uh, the piano concerto again. And then George Bernard Shaw, thinking that he was helping, got the BBC to commission the Third Symphony. And Elgar immediately cannibalized some of the sketches that he was uh, that were marked to be a concerto. And he turned them into a symphony, which didn't, uh, didn't transpire until Tony Payne finished it off for him. Mm. Mm. So the, these are uh, these improvisations. How far do you think towards a piano concerto was Elgar? Was he was he, you know, would would is there enough material in all of that to create something that that could be reconstructed towards a, a you know, something resembling a full concerto? Well, at the moment, I'm in a position where I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> okay. what I mean, you'll give us the scoop if you uh, if, <laughs> if you can. <laughs> yes, I will. Great. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about your programme as well, Mark, um, because I, I think it's important that we let people know what, what they can expect yeah. at, at the festival as well. Um, as well as, uh, I mean, this this John Arland piece, which I just listened mm. to uh, earlier this morning, in fact, because I, I was not familiar with it, is is incredible. It's a fascinating piece. Um, could you tell us a little about the a little bit about the island and also the the. Um, the, the Alwyn piece as well. Yes. The Sonata well, Alla we're, we're, is a fantastic piece. It and again, is. And again, it's something I haven't heard before. Um, it's, and, it, and it's, it's very unusual in some ways as a sort of sonata, but it's full of um, energy and, and so many brilliant absolutely. ideas. And, and it's a very nice um, yin and yang, as it were, because we have Mr. and Mrs. Alwyn in the programme with, mm -hmm. with Doreen Carl Withen, who was the mm -hmm. second who became um, the second um, Mrs. Alwyn. Um, and that story in itself is 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 fascinating and has been um, recounted fantastically well in Leah Broad's book um, Quartet. Yeah. Um, so Carl Withen is a, it was a composer who I I had the the good fortune to to do the recorded premiere of this sonatina that I'm playing a, about eight years ago, and it's a very very fine work, and I had the feeling then that that. Occasionally, there's a spark of something really special in her writing, of, of something that's truly inspirational, um, that in some way, I think I felt at the time, was potentially more interesting than Alwyn's piano music, actually. And I'd recorded um, the Fantasy Waltzes, which is his very big work that he wrote for John Ogden. Um, but then I came across this sonata a la Toccata, which was written for another very significant um, British pianist, Dennis Matthews who's again, you know, somewhat fallen off uh, everyone's radar, but a very, very significant figure. Um, and I thought the concision of this work, it, it makes it uh, ideal for programmes and an ideal introduction to audiences who don't know um, much about William Alwyn or indeed English piano music. So I was immediately drawn to it. And it's, it does have such wonderful optimistic energy um, and a gloriously lyrical and intimate and sad slow movement which is only about two and a half minutes long but it says in the in the course of its 10 minutes everything that needs to be said in a beautifully beautifully structured way uh which isn't always the case um i have to say structure um is 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 one of the problems with quite a few uh of of, of composers writing um sonatas british piano sonatas um so I thought that would be a nice start. And then I love, it actually written the same year uh, as 1949 as the, uh, as the Sonata Alla Toccata, this sonatina by, by Doreen Carl Withen, much more progressive in terms of the musical language. She was clearly much more alive to what was going on within Europe, um, yeah. generally than Alwyn, I think. Um, but also full at times of, the, of wonderful filmic gestures, because she was one of the early recipients of a scholarship um, to study film music. Um, but some incredibly audacious harmonic side slips, particularly in the last movement, that really are fantastic um, and a glorious um, ending to this sonatina. So, you know, I'm thrilled to have the chance to... Uh, to play her and also to see that she's gaining ground. Uh, possibly, I have to say, the Owen Foundation say she's great. She's gaining more ground 
than her husband at the moment. And most of the uh, most inquiries to the William Elwin Foundation are actually for Doreen Carl Withers' music rather than Williams. Um, I hope that that will that balance will redress itself a little more in the years to come. But I understand exactly why we should have the enthusiasm for her. Um, so that's a rather nice symmetry there. And then I'm finishing with, I think, this possibly one of the finest British piano works of the 20th century, um, Sarnia, which is the depiction of, of a place that he loved. And strangely enough, what, one of the, of the places for a relatively short period of time where he experienced great personal happiness. Um, and that was something that was in short supply for, for poor John Ireland. Um, and the kind of, there's a lyrical ardor to the second movement of this in a May morning, which I'm hoping um, when I come and play it, it will be a sunshine morning. And then I think we'll understand even more um, how appropriate the writing is here. And then a, a glorious last movement, which if you shut your eyes, or you, you might think Ravel. And I think actually if by a slip of the pen, um, John Ireland had signed this last movement, Maurice Ravel, we would be hearing this every week because it's right. glorious music. And it has the kind of this underlay of wonderful um, John Ireland chromaticism, which is what gives his music this wonderful bittersweet quality. And also this, uh, this wonderful quality that uh, uh, only rarely does Ireland present a melody which fulfills itself. And I think, again, this is connected with the psychology of the man because life was never happy for him for any length of long time. Relationships always were sour for him. And he struggled throughout his life to, uh, to be able to recognize the kind of relationships that would give him satisfaction. And indeed, living at a time when that would have been very difficult in any case. Um, and so you have this glorious melody in the last movement, but it doesn't quite fulfill itself. And it's the the not fulfilling of itself that makes it so beautifully sad. Um, and so the riches, I can't express enough, I think the riches of, of this glorious piano work, um, written just actually before he, he, he was, I think, the last passenger on the last boat to leave the Channel Islands be before the Nazi invasion. So he had a jolly lucky escape and mm. this work had just been completed. Um, so it's a, it's a great work. Um, so so without, then, without, without stretch it, stretching sort of parallels too much or, or, or reading into things, that, that is something that does bring a lot of uh, British music under, under a, an umbrella of, of sort of this bright, energetic you know pastoral scene yeah. mixed with yeah. a kind of melancholy and a darkness which yeah. you sort of yeah. you see those two themes sort of swirling in in you know Vaughan Williams perhaps or, or very much um, I, I, I think a very central theme to Englishness is is melancholy really mm -hmm. um, we see it in the visual arts we see it in the poetry of the period um, and and a lot in the music and I think if there were a strand that we perhaps do even in the piano music better or as well as anyone else, it's it's that feeling of, of yeah. melancholy. And when John Ireland, who was of a particularly poetical bent, when he wrote a miniature called The Darkened Valley, um, and then he quotes from William Blake, you really sense the kind of isolation of, of, of the man and, and the soul of the yeah. man at the time when he wrote that. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, David, you were, it, it, when you're talking about Elgar, the the idea of melancholy is never that far away as you said about these sorts of you know we, we think about the cello concerto for example it's more obvious perhaps but there's that side to a lot of Elgar's music as well it's never that far away these sorts of strands of um mm. you know sh shifting harmonies leading us towards something slightly sadder yes it's very important not to think that Elgar was a, an imperialist tub thumper yeah um uh, there's so much more to 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 him and to and to to many composers than that. I'm really pleased, Mark, to hear you uh, talking. Like, I've I've never I, I I shall come and listen to Sarnia. I've I've never played very much John Ireland, and mm. sometimes do do you find that there's a, a you there's something that doesn't quite click 
in your own mind. I mean, I sometimes find that I'm absolutely on the same wavelength as this composer or that composer. I've mm. never found it yet with uh, John Ireland, whose music I much admire, yeah. but it's not music that I especially uh, find a way to uh, to put out in, in, the, in the way that I do with uh, Somerville or Elgar or, or, you know, some of the people okay. that I play more of. I mean, what, what, what was the piece that was the turning point when you, you said you learned John Ireland very quickly? What I was did, the one that made you think, wow? I think I, Sarnia was the one. Sarnia yeah. was the one. And I think some of the other miniatures, April is absolutely beautiful. Um, and then, you know, it, it's, it's, it was at one stage well known, the island spell, I-S-L-A-N-D. But actually, you know, French though it may be, it's so gloriously beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, you know, actually it was such a good thing that I had to learn the whole of, 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 of his music. And then I began to appreciate the preludes a lot more. Um, I, I think you must find this, David, actually the discipline of sometimes having to learn something it is the only way that you begin to plumb the riches of it, actually. Um, yes. Otherwise, you know, a casual acquaintance of something oft, often allows us to, uh, uh, to, to, to not bother with things. Uh, um, mm -hmm. I, think, I think that that's, that's been part of my journey. Um, Getting, I think getting to know composers through complete cycles has been, for me, fascinating. I'd like to ask you a question, David, because these improvisations of Elgar, I, one particularly distinguished critic said to me, you must not, under no circumstances, you must promise me you will never play these, you will never touch them, because they are by their very nature ephemeral. They represent a composer improvising. We have no right to commit those further than Elgar and his improvisation. How do you, um, do you think there's any validity in that viewpoint? Yes, well, I, I felt very strongly that they should not be published uh, right. in, 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 in an attempt to write down what he did. Yeah. Um, what I'm, I'm, I'm obviously working on these improvisations and I'm trying to be Elga. Obviously, okay, um, because Elga, and th that's to say that what I write down uh, is much tidier for a start than what Elgar wrote, because and and uh, in much more much more metrical than what Elgar wrote, and right. uh, and and harmonically sometimes a little clearer. There are a couple of moments where you can tell that Elgar is trying to arrive at a, a crucial discord. And the, the the right discord escapes him at the at mm -hmm. the wrong moment, if you see mm -hmm. what I mean. So so I I do quite agree that uh, they should not be written down. Um, I have enjoyed playing them for thirty five years, so I don't. Okay. Think I'm, I'm not, not going to go and cut my throat about that. No, but, no, no, absolutely. No. I, I find it interesting to so as it were. Are you currently are you elaborating on on Elgar's improvisations, or are you 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 are simply. Um, are you reconstructing them in any way? Yes. I'm oh, right. But as I say, I, I can't possibly say. No, I see. This is work in progress. Okay, but this, very this, interesting. Interview, this interview finds me at a delicate moment. Um, <laughs> okay. So to avoid the delicate moment, what, what I should say is, of course, to go back to John Ireland. Now, John yeah. Ireland's uh, best-known tune, and indeed a wonderful, fulfilled tune, mm. it is, is the hymn tune Love Unknown. My mm. song is Love Unknown. And uh, you, you might be interested to know that there are two versions of that. If you look at the uh, version published in the early Songs of Praise, the first edition of Songs of Praise, uh, that's one version. And then if mm. you look at Hymns Ancient and Modern Revised, uh, you'll mm. find another version. And there's no paper trail at all. And the difference between them is that Ireland, presumably Ireland, I don't know, or Sidney Nicholson, perhaps, I don't know, um, whoever was editing um, Ancient and Modern Revised, found a way to put an appoggiatura in the tenor part. Always a dangerous thing to do, to give tenors a chance. But um, but uh, th it's just before, ta da da di 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 just before that last line, the tenors in the revised version are given a chance to go, ta da like that and it's actually very <laughs> expressive and it came into my mind when you were saying about this um well this melancholy because mm. you've got these melancholy tenors sort of 
haunting mm. away on mm. this. Mm. Mm. Exactly the same interval, of course, as no, 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 it's that. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Tone. And it's interesting yeah. that it's a falling tone, not a falling mm -hmm. semitone, if I may get a mm. little tiny bit technical there. Because no, of falling semitone, well, I know it's not too technical for us, but I mean, we're hoping that there'll be others than us three yeah. listening. <laughs> um, but a falling semitone has a, a particular flavour to it, and, and a, mm. a falling tone very clearly mm. has, has a different one. And interestingly enough, it's the falling tone, the different flavour that has appealed both to Elgar and to John Ireland in that instance. Mm. 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 Yep. I'm interested as well, if we could just reference a, a, a point and a very different viewpoint um, for me when you were saying about you know, the ease with which audiences will listen to, to English, British piano music. I find, you know, outside of the festivals that we both know, Three Choirs, English Music Festival, maybe two or three others maximum, um, it is still quite challenging to get a promoter um, to take on um, even a small extract of, it, of 20th century English piano music because they see it. Mm -hmm automatically as a, as a potential drop in box office, mm. um, which is, you know, and then when they've heard it, often the reaction of the audience is so enthusiastic. Well, we had no idea that this composer wrote, you know, and that we would enjoy it in this way. That's absolutely wonderful. But I think it is worth saying, um, certainly for me, and I'm sure for you, perhaps in, in, in past years, David, how enormously indebted I am to the British music trusts who support performances and recordings of their composers, of which, you know, the John Ireland Trust has been so um, wonderfully supportive of me. The Bliss, uh, the, the, the Bridge, uh, the, sorry, the Arthur Bliss Trust in particular, for performances I'm doing next year of his piano concerto, they simply would not be happening um, without the support of British music trusts. And I think it is worth considering um, you know, the Bliss Piano Concerto was played so much by Solomon, written for him. And I was mentioning earlier before you, you joined us that, that Rubinstein, at the height of his youthful fame, chose to make his, his proms debut um, in the John Ireland Piano Concerto, mm -hmm. which sh shows, um, and he talks quite a lot in his memoirs about the John Ireland Piano Concerto. He played it internationally a lot and wanted to record it. We don't have, um, I suppose, we don't. Ha we need to have a Lang Lang. And I think he did play the Vaughan Williams Piano Concerto once, but we need a Yujo Wang and a Lang Lang. Um, we need these kind of figures that have um, such a kind of huge public following to be able to take up some of these piano concertos. And then I think mm -hmm. maybe, you know, they, they'll become a lot, a lot more audience um, favourites, really. And yes, I absolutely. remember, I remember, I studied right at the end of her life with Phyllis Selick, who was one of um, this wonderful generation of, of English pianists, along with um, Harriet Cohen and Dame Myra Hess, all of whom, and she, Phyllis had played, you know, works by Tippett. He wrote his first piano sonata for her. Vaughan Williams wrote that wonderful two piano work for, for her and Cyril. And, um, you know, when you'd got pianists of that caliber playing this kind of music, it seemed that it opened, helped open up doors for promoters and audiences. We ju it does seem, and, and I'm no, sorry, I remember her saying that the Rawsthorn piano concertos were played by every British pianist of a certain generation. Every orchestra in the UK says the same thing now, box office poison. Um, and I don't quite know how we fight our corner on this, David, except to say that uh, I find I am so indebted to the trusts uh, mm. for their help in persuading orchestras to go ahead with performances. Yes, it's a, it's a very clever funding model, of course, and uh, yeah, and it particularly applies to um, to composers who died without heirs. Yes, um, which <laughs> and, of, and of course we haven't even touched on on you know contemporary composers. You know we've got we've got so many wonderful British composers writing mm. writing new music for us constantly as well. Um, and I I hope at the piano festival we'll we'll hear more of that alongside um, everything that that you're both bringing. Um, I I also um, think it's interesting that that we've got you know your your two. 
uh, concerts at the festival. And we're not particularly framing because I think that has been something we've seen in programming. You know, Rubra has to be framed by Brahms or something like that yeah. for you to sort of really appreciate it and understand it. Mm. And, and Rubra is a composer that I've only just recently sort of, you know, uh, explored and it's absolutely mm. fantastic music yeah um but it you know that came to me because i had I, I was there for a concert of other material and mm. i just happened to hear mm. it um but i hope there'll be more opportunities of, of you know for, for these composers to be um to be shown not just at the uh, at the various festivals that that i know you're both involved with but um hopefully david through some of your upcoming broadcasts as well, we'll we'll have a, a light shone on on this. Well, um, I'm I'm Paul Williamson next weekend. I'm great. I'm building a library on a sea symphony. Um, oh, great! Excellent. We will oh, tune in. East the sea symphony. My word! Yeah. I was going to ask you, Mark, how much you thought um, Englishness in music had to do with the rhythms of the language and indeed the word order of the language. Um, I, 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 this is insufficiently looked at, I think, but Vaughan Williams mm. in the Sea Symphony uh, mentioned that he was particularly influenced by the phrase from Elgar's Dream of Gerontius, Thou art calling me. And that triplet um, became uh, very, very, well, it's all pervading in the Sea Symphony. Ta, 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 ta. And the interesting mm. thing is that the English triplet, I mean, I remember when I used to have composition lessons with John Gardner, the holly and the ivy, that John Gardner. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. He used to say, well, the English triplet is the, the most English thing. And what he didn't tell me was that it was invented in 1910 by Vaughan Williams. But the really fascinating thing about the English triplet is that Vaughan Williams applies it to words in the English language that require the English triplet. Uh, there's quite a lot of grammatical constructions that go ta 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 couldn't be bothered or whatever it might, might be. <laughs> um, and uh, Elgar, in giving the exemplar of the English triplet, thou art calling me, that's not required. He didn't need it to be a triplet. There are a couple of uh, English triplets, as it were, in the dream of Gerontius. The first one is actually in the mouth of Gerontius himself, and it's uh, Cruella, Cruella still. Um, so, and, it, and it's rather a funny word to give three Cruella, mm. you know, Cruella, mm. but Cruella. And that's the first English triplet. And uh, I, it, it's, it's rather a fascinating thing. And you know, you see it in, I mean, you're touring with the Czech orchestra. They'll all be full mm. of Janet. And they'll all be going pom 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 at the ends of things, won't they? Because Yana Czech. I hope not. Czech the, I, I hope not the going, emperor. Pom, pom, pom. But <laughs> they're, 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 yeah, rhythms. So it, is rhythms. this because sure. you, you you mentioned before, David, that that the choral tradition in in this in, in country has a has a lot to do with the way composers sort of evolved. Do you think there is a link between the amount of choral music that composers were often you know engaged to write has an influence on on the way they composed for the piano i do i think we ought to all be grateful to henry the eighth <laughs> <laughs> well this is so another the, subject david we we must let you go english, because we've we... the english choral tradition i should explain <laughs> yeah. yeah that's another another topic the great thing is um for those who are listening David will be giving a lecture recital. Um, so I'm sure we will get to hear you speak a little bit about some of this repertoire and some of these other themes um, at Ludlow. Um, and I'll just say briefly, when you're both performing, uh, Mark, you're, you're the 10.30 slot at Ludlow Assembly Rooms on Friday the 24th of May, and David, you're the following morning, Saturday the 25th, also at the Assembly Rooms at 10.30. Um, the programmes can be found online um, and we, we look, forward to seeing you both in Ludlow then thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us and I, I know pleasure. we can go on there's so much more to talk about um but I, I really appreciate your time and, and we look forward to seeing you in Ludlow thank, thank you. you very much goodbye bye-bye Bye -bye. This is Alastair McGowan, founder of the Ludlow Piano Festival. Our second festival takes place uh, between May the 22nd and May the 26th, 2024. 19 events in five days at three different venues in this beautiful and historic Shropshire town of Ludlow. You can book now for any of the events or, hey, all of the events at ludlowpianofestival.com. I hope to see you at something there. Mm -hmm.